Amen. If you would, please uh, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 4. John, chapter 4. And we are going to start at verse 21. John, chapter 4. Starting verse 21. John chapter 4, verse 21. And when you get there, just give me the biggest smile. Oh, yeah, thank you. Very good. This is what happened in the life and times of Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought to, to him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, One sows, and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Would you all pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love your word. Thank you so much for the testimony of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, this word that gives us hope, this word that gives us energy, this word that gives us urgency, Father, when we have none, Lord. We thank you so much for the word of God. Now, Lord Jesus, may you work with us through your spirit. Father, may you move my flesh aside, let the very spirit of Jesus minister and intercede for everyone here, Lord, that your word may perform surgery upon our hearts and minds, Lord, that we may be better when we leave here than when we came. God, that you would work a work, and Lord, that as you speak to us, Lord, that we would hear from you and respond. And we pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I think many people would understand the words we sang just a while ago. I am broken inside. Amen. Lord, I give you my life. And that's really where I had to come to terms with in my own relationship with God. And, and you know, I, I grew up in the church. Any of y'all ever, any, any of y'all grew up in the church? Some church kids, amen. Be proud, I'm a church kid. I, I was raised up in church. We're like the worst. 
Like we learn how to like talk like a Christian. We learn how to behave like one. We learn what to say, what not to say, when to say it. We know all the little church terms and we know all the little systems. We know all the little things. But here's the thing. All those things do not save. Knowing theology doesn't save you. And listen, I'll go a step further. Knowing scripture doesn't save you. It's placing your faith in Jesus Christ. That's what saves you. I mean, we look at that parable. Jesus said, he said, many will come to the Lord and say, Lord, did we not prophecy in your name? Did we not perform great works? Amen. But he's going to look at them and say what? Depart from me, for I never knew you. If that shouldn't shake you just a little bit, amen? Just shake you a little bit, amen? That, that the, the very idea of us coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ and having salvation with him is dependent upon faith and repentance in the gospel of Jesus. And so here's, here's the thing, though. You know, when I was coming up in church and I was trying to understand who God was and who I was in God, and it doesn't help when you have anger or bitterness towards God. I don't know if you've ever been angry with God before or you've ever just been mad. And when you're a young teenager, uh, you're already mad at the world. You're mad at every, any, anything and everybody. It's all these like things inside of you just waging a war inside of you. And, and, and on top of that, then you have the spiritual elements and your own brokenness to deal with. But I, I distinctly and clearly remember when I had an encounter with God. And it changed me. You will know when you have an encounter with God because it changes you. You look at any person in the Old Testament when God appeared before them. Remember Moses and the burning bush, right? Remember Joshua when that warrior appeared before him? Remember Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? Remember the king that threw him in the, in the fire? Hey, even he had a heart change, amen? And so when you have an encounter with God, when you're faced with his holiness and his goodness, something happens. And that's what happened with me. And it happened in a church service, in a winter camp with youth. Uh, I just felt the presence of God for the first time. Now, if I really think about it, I bet there were times in my life where the presence of God and the Spirit, uh, the Spirit of God wanted to actually get my attention. But it wasn't happening. Because my attention and my focus was on everything but Jesus Christ. And, and here, here's the thing. God can be all around you trying to get your attention, trying to talk to you, trying to change your life, and you could just not even realize it or know it. That's why I love the story of the Samaritan woman because Jesus, the Son of God, was talking to her at the well and she had no idea who he was. And there's times in our lives where God's actively trying to work into our lives and do something amazing and we have no clue, we have no idea what he's really trying to do. Uh, this, this past year, I, I've had some interesting encounters with, with, with uh, different people. I, I, I helped out a small hospice uh, company uh, with some chaplaincy. And so I visited a lot of much older people in different, you know, forms. And a lot, a lot of them didn't know Jesus. It was very interesting. And so one particular lady I went to see, I looked all over this really nice uh, assisted living place. I mean, it was very nice. Uh, it was like downtown Charleston. It was very, very swanky. It was awesome. I walked in there. I was looking all over her. I went to her room. She wasn't there. And I asked the staff, and she says, oh, that person. And I, I, I immediately said, oh, man, this is going to be fun, you know. And, uh, and so she said she's probably up front with her friends. I'm like, okay. And so I walked all the way up front, and there she was with about four or five other ladies, and they were playing rummy. And I walked up to her, and I was like, hi, uh, my name is Pastor so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, I would like to come and sort of talk to you. And she says, who? And I, I said, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher. And she goes, Oh, son, I got a hot hand right here. And, <laughs> and she, she says, and I don't want to stop playing right now. 
And I looked at all the women, and I was like, well, listen, this does seem like a serious game. So uh, what if I just, you know, prayed with you right here, and I'll come back a little bit later, you know, maybe later in the week. And she was, okay, that'd be fine. And so I sat there, and I prayed for them, and I prayed. I was like, Lord, let this winning streak continue, you know. And they all kind of giggled and laughed, and I, and I went on my way. And uh, a few weeks later, I did come back, but by, but she just didn't want to give me, like, any kind of time. You know, and, and she had her dog with her. The dog's name was Hannah the Fifth. I love that dog's name. Because Hannah the Fifth is so distinct because you know that there were probably four others before Hannah, you know. And I was trying to talk to her, and she just looked at me with such kind eyes, and she says, I really don't want to talk about this right now. You see, she had terminal cancer. And it was very progressive. But she wasn't ready to talk about it. You know what I've discovered? You can't force Jesus on nobody. You cannot force Christ. I love what Jesus said. Do you know Jesus had such wisdom? Amen. It's like maybe we should start listening to Jesus. I know, right? But listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. Isn't that interesting? That tells me that our appointment with God is divine. That God wishes to meet with us at a very divine, beautiful moment where He is drawing you towards the Son. And the Holy Spirit is actively working on you. But here's the thing. Have you ever heard of the expression, grieving the Holy Spirit? That's, that's essentially when we tell the Holy Spirit no. I don't know if you've ever been in one of those moments where you just know the Spirit of God is moving and working on you, but you just like, no, I'm not ready, or I don't I think I can. You know, when the Holy Spirit moves, our first response is just to say, yes, Lord. Because you have no idea where they might lead you or where it might take you. But I, I love this moment because Jesus was in that particular beautiful moment. He was by a well, and it just so happens, isn't that interesting? It just so happens this lady comes to the well at the same time looking for water. I love this moment. And they have a casual conversation, and Jesus says, well, won't you get me some water? And she goes, why are you talking to me, a Samaritan woman? If you have any idea of cultural understanding, the Jews looked down on Samaritans. They saw them as an unclean race because of, of years ago, many Jews left the faith and married in with the Canaanites, and that originated the Samaritans, so they kind of looked down upon them. They didn't see them as a faithful people. But Jesus spoke to a Samaritan, and on top of that, a woman, which was just culturally not done. It surprised her. You know what I've learned about Jesus? Is that he loves everybody. That he'll receive anyone. And here's the big thing. If Jesus loves everybody, and Jesus receives everybody, don't you think the church should too? Amen. Jesus came to a broken and sinful world. He came to us and loved us where we were at. And he loved us so much, he wants to pour his spirit into us and make us into what he's always called us to be. Amen? And the church should be the place where people find that out. The church should actually be going out into this dark world and showing them the light of Jesus. And so Jesus, as he's talking to her, things get a little bit more deeper in the conversation. You know, Jesus said, if you knew who was asking you for water, you would ask him for living water, a water that never runs dry. And then the lady was like, well, give me some of that water. And he said, sure, well, call your husband. I wish I could have saw this conversation, guys. I just wish I could have saw it because when he said, call your husband over, she goes, oh, I, I'm not married. And he says, yeah, you're right, you're not married. You've had five husbands, and the one you're with is not your husband. Oh, man, Jesus. <laughs> right? I wish I could have saw her face, you know? She's visibly shocked. 
I mean, and we don't know what kind of time frame we're talking here. We have no idea if Jesus went all the way back to her very young days when she married the first time. But Jesus knew her past. He knew her. He knew her brokenness. And he looked at her in love because she was lying to herself and lying to him. Amen? You ever lie to yourself and lie to, lie to the Lord? Amen? She was doing this. You see, Jesus, the only way he can ever fix and correct our brokenness is through truth. That's why Jesus said the truth will what? And it does. It sets us free. Jesus wants us to come to the truth, come to the living water and, and drink of it. Amen? And so here's this lady, and she says, oh, I'm not married. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then she looks at him, and she says, you must be a prophet. Amen. But, you know, we don't worship where you worship. And that's such, such an interesting conversation. If you've ever talked to anybody about church or about religion or anything like that, they will immediately shift this subject or try to change it to get it off of them. Amen. If you ever try to be personal or talk about with somebody personally about their faith, they'll shift it to church or activity or something like that. Jesus, he always went for the heart of things, amen. I was talking to a young man, he, he came by here uh, years ago when we were setting up some printer stuff, and I was talking to him, and he was uh, out of Columbia, and he just recently moved here, and I was talking to him, and I was like, well, hey man, uh, have you found a church to go to or anything? He goes, oh yeah, well, you know, not yet. I, I've been down here for a little bit, and I'm still looking, but... I've been watching, my, my church does an online service. I've been watching that. And I was like, oh, all right, man. And, and he says, yeah, I've been here, man, about a year or two now. I still haven't found a church. And I, and I said, well, well, how's the online service? Is that pretty good? He goes, oh, man, honestly, I haven't watched it in a few months. Right? And I kind of sensed in him a longing to belong. A long, you know, if you stay too long away from the body of Christ, Things happen. Amen? You know, we are so strong when we're together. Amen? This lady here sounds like most of her life she has dealt with brokenness, isolation, and rejection. And she probably had a reputation among her people. Let's just be honest. Amen? She probably had a very rough life. She came to the well at the hottest time of the day to get water. And do you know why that really is? Haven't you ever not wanted to talk to anybody or, or see anybody? Wouldn't it make sense if you would go to a place where there would be the least likeliness of you ever running into anybody? She went during that time. And I love it because you know who was there? Jesus. He was there. And his word to her is this. We just read it earlier, but look with it uh, with me again on verse 21. He said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, but we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in what? Spirit and what? Truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Christians, God wishes for you to encounter Him in worship. And listen, Worship is not confined to a church. Worship is not confined to an hour a week. Worship is what we do with our life. Our very life is a worship song to Christ Jesus. What we do in the flesh affects us spiritually. Matter of fact, I believe that everything we do can be an act of worship unto God in Christ Jesus. How we treat others is worship. How we eat, ooh yeah, amen? That can be worship. How we sing, how we pray, how we witness, 
You see, I think one of the highest forms of worship is witnessing. And when I say witness, I mean being the light and the salt Christ has called the church to be. You see, if you know Christ Jesus, you're not going to be able to help it because he shines through. He shines through you. You can't help it. His love compels you. Because when we spend time with God, he changes us. God wishes for you to encounter him every day. He wishes to encounter you. And here's, here's where our problem is. Because God's never going to say, oh, I think you've had too much of me today. Amen? God doesn't do that with us. But see, we do that with him. I think I've had too much of you today, God. Amen? And so we must kind of, uh, and it has to be a lifestyle of worship. Meaning this, that you are aware of the presence of God. He is continually around you. See, his promises hold true. Jesus said, I would never leave you, nor what? Forsake you. Amen? And if, if that promise is true, and it holds true, then Christ Jesus is with us during the days that we know we're worshiping and the days we know we're not worshiping, man, that, that Jesus is still with us. He loves us. He's not going to forsake us. And he's called us to be a living testament and living word for him on the earth. God wants you to worship him in spirit and in truth. Someone who does not have the spirit of God cannot worship God. We can go through all the motions. Where the Spirit is, there's life. Where the Spirit is, there's salvation. Now check this out. Could there be a church with Spirit and no truth? Ooh, no. That's not good. You know what that church would look like? Purely driven on feelings and emotions. Just a show and an experience. And really, it's not the spirit, it's a spirit. And that's frightening, right? But could you have a church with no spirit and just truth? Oh man, that would be a really hurtful church, people. It would just be all, ouch. Get sanctified, a French pride. Remember that one? Turn or burn. You remember that one? Amen. What if it's just all truth and no spirit? That'll be a very religious, legalistic, very judgmental place. Amen. We must worship God in spirit, in the spirit, and the truth. Amen. And the only way you can do that is to be a child of God. Amen. That's the only way. And that's Jesus' promise. And then he says... Uh, or she brings up the Messiah, and I love this because he looks at her and he's just like, yeah, that's me. Isn't that awesome? This is the one passage, right? We see that yeah, Jesus is like, yeah, that's me. He tells the Samaritan woman, yeah, that's me. And the disciples weren't around to hear it. I just love that. You know, they went off to get food, and there's talk about how he could be the Messiah, and then Jesus just straight up tells this lady, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm the Messiah. I just love it. And then it says, just then the disciples came. Like, they missed it, right? I love this. It's so amazing. And they were astonished because he's speaking to this woman. And, and no one said, why, what do you want or why you're speaking to her? But the woman, what did she leave behind? Her water jar. The very purpose of her ever even coming there, she left behind because she found something way better than water. She found living water. And she told her people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Can he not be the Messiah? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. I love this because the reason why they left Jesus was to go get him food. To go get him like, I don't know, when they went to, you know, we go and get, you know, some of that Jesus chicken, Chick-fil-A, don't we? You can't get it on the Sabbath though, Amen. Can't get it on the Sabbath. I don't know what they went and got him, but they can't, they went all the way to town and got him food, brought it back, and Jesus is like, oh yeah, I've already, I've already got food. <laughs> I just love it. I got food you don't know about. 
I would be so mad if my master, my rabbi, sent me to get food for him, and he's like, oh, yeah, I have sneak, secret snacks, you know? That would make me angry, right? But all we think about is the physical need. Jesus is talking about something way deeper than the physical need of food because Jesus looks at, looks at them and says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to complete his work. Christians, this is beautiful. Jesus said that that's his food. That's his nourishment. That's what sustains him. That's what grows him. And Christians, our food should also be, amen, the will of the Lord. That should be what sustains us. That should be what grows us. That's what should be nourishing us, obeying God. Because listen, Jesus has not called any of us to be perfect, and no one could ever achieve perfection in your entire life. Amen? You'll never be able to achieve perfection. Jesus has never called us to be perfect because he himself was the perfect lamb of God. And he, he sacrificed himself for us so that we could be covered under his grace. But what Jesus has called us is to be obedient. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what I command you. Amen. Jesus said, I have food you don't know about. And this food is about my father's business. Amen. But it gets deeper because Jesus reveals the work that he is giving them and that he is going to commission them. Listen to what Jesus says to them. Do you not say four months more than comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you. See how the fields are what? Ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. This is beautiful. I am a product of somebody planting the seed of God in my heart, the word of God in my heart. I'm a product of that. And then someone else came and watered that seed poured love onto a young man trying to figure out faith and that seed of salvation grew and turned into a new creation in Christ Jesus for his service now listen many people played a part in that but God gets all the glory for it amen you are also a product of laborers and reapers and Jesus is calling us into the same work of sowing the word of God, watering, loving, pouring yourself out on others to see them know Christ Jesus. I think one of the things that, that God really broke my heart and mind one day is I was at uh, Northwoods Mall. And you know how all those, man, there's so many cars there sometimes. It's like near, I think it was Christmas Eve because I'm a procrastinator, you know. I had to buy those last-minute uh, Christmas gifts, you know, and it, it was just so many people everywhere. And this song on the radio uh, came on. It, it, it was a Christian song. I can't even remember the, the words or the name of it. Just the, the very expression of it clicked something in my head. And I saw all these people walking everywhere, and it dawned on me. I asked myself this question, how many of those people actually know Jesus? How many of those people actually know that Jesus loves them, died for them, and is alive today for them. That, that God, his spirit is all around them. And they're walking all around him and, and his grace and his mercy, the very air that we're breathing, the very heartbeat that we have, every one of them given as a gift to us from him. Do we really understand all those people around us? Do they get it? Do they understand? And just this overwhelming sadness hit my heart because I was like, Jesus, I just want all of them to know you because I have experienced you. I experienced you at my lowest and you brought me up and fixed my brokenness. And I want everyone else to experience that encounter that I know is true. And so every Christian, if you've encountered Christ Jesus, you should have this burning urgency and this desire that others would experience this encounter that you've experienced. 
And here's what's beautiful. Everyone's encounter is so different, but it's just as beautiful and just as powerful and leads to salvation and newness of life. Because I found living water at a very young age, and I pray that you have this living water You see, what this woman did is she went back to her people. No matter what kind of reputation she had, what kind of past she had, she went to everybody there, and everybody knew what she did, but she met a stranger who knew her whole life. And she told everybody she could about this man, and she brought her entire village over to meet Jesus. And how long did Jesus stay? Two days. Two days with Samaritans. Jesus came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Isn't just this mind-blowing that Jesus came to the Samaritans, the people who were not expecting him, and they received him so quickly. They had no religion. They just had brokenness and confusion. And Jesus, they wanted him so badly. And the Pharisees who spent all of their lives in the temple and in religious training, the Son of God stood before them, and they could not see him. I think some of us are blind because we think we can see. I think some of us are still broken because we think that we are fixed. I think some of us are empty because we think we're full but we're just full of what the world can give, not what Christ can give. You see, you can't force anybody to believe or want this thing. You have to wait for their appointed time, but you have to be obedient to Christ Jesus. You see that sweet little old lady I I was trying to visit and trying to talk to, she had a hot hand of rummy. I kept on going, it's like about eight weeks I was going and she was always on the move. And so what I had to do is I, I started to catch her as she's leaving her room, and I would just start walking with her and Hannah the fifth. And she, had, she, had, uh, the, she was a slow mover, and so we just kind of walked together and we talked, and she liked to walk into the garden section. We walked in there through the little lobby, and then I'd walk her back to her room, and we'd say, you know, good day, and bye, Hannah the fifth, you know. And then this continued for uh, a good while. And one day I called her, as she was coming out with Hannah the fifth again, and she said, would you walk this way with me? And so we walked around a different way. I've never been this way. We went outside a back door to a park area with a bench that was facing like a man, one of those man-made lakes, you know? And we sat down, and she just looked at me. And she said, I know my time is soon and I reckon I need to talk to you about about God. She said, I've been alive for 92 years, and I've never really thought much about God. Can you tell me what I need to know? I said, yes, ma'am. God created everything and he loves us so much but sin separated us that's why God sent his one and only son into the world and he lived a perfect life and died on the cross so that we could receive forgiveness from all sin and when we put our faith in him and repent of the sin that's in our life at We all have sin. He is just, and he will forgive us of our sin. And then she smiled and she says, I reckon we need to pray then. That moment would have never happened if I just thought, well, she seems fine. That moment would have never happened if I said, man, I just can't connect with this lady. That moment would have never happened if I got frustrated. That moment would have never happened if I tried to force something on her. That moment had to happen because I invested in her. And she knew I actually cared for her. 
I guess what I'm really saying is love goes much further than anything else. And I, I guess that's why it says that God is love. And everyone who knows God knows what love is. Because God is love. And here's my, my, my prayer. Is that everyone here knows this love, but also that everyone here is allowing that love to transform you. Because that's where the power is. That's where you worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for moments that we can't create. Moments that only you can. And so, Christ Jesus, I pray, if someone, if their moment is tonight, Father, let that moment be tonight that they receive you in all of your love. Lord Jesus, that they would run to the cross, that would they would cross the line of faith, and Lord, never look back, that they would just whisper these precious and beautiful words, Jesus, I give you my life, I give you my heart. Jesus, I give you my life, I give you my heart. And Lord, you are faithful, God, and you will receive them into your side. And we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.